We're good? Yeah. All right, great. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here for the first time speaking to you guys. Uh, first time, but strangely, it feels like I've done this before. <laughs> Uh, also, a little correction, I am not the pastor of the Chinese Presbyterian Church of Oakland. The Chinese Presbyterian Church of Oakland actually doesn't have a pastor. I am merely the youth director. Um, so, I uh, do stuff. <laughs> okay, why don't we uh, open up a word of prayer. Father, as we come to your word, I pray that you would give us hearts that desire to hear, Lord, not just some guy, but Lord, that we would hear you, that we would hear the words of Jesus. And Lord, may your words come and impact our lives to, to change us. Father, uh, help us to be alert and attentive. Help me to speak clearly. Help me to be alert and attentive and not be sleeping. But Lord, uh, we, we give this time to you. May your Holy Spirit do his powerful work through your word as you have promised. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text today, I think it's in your bulletins, or if you want, you can turn to your Bibles to 1 Peter. And first Peter, we are just going to deal with the first two verses. So they're like, wow, how is this guy going to preach just two verses? Uh, so let's give our undivided attention to God's word. First Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It begins Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. This is God's word. So the first question I might ask you is, who are you? Okay, I, mean, all right, I know probably more than half of you in the room. That's not quite the question I'm asking. My question is, if I were just to ask you right off the spot, Pick one word to describe yourself. Pick one word to identify yourself. Right? Not too late. What is it? I think the word that we pick will say a lot about ourselves. You know, I grew up in Canada. Anyone here know what Canada is? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. And you know, when I came to the States, I identified myself a lot as a Canadian. Because I really did feel like I attended in a strange world. For one thing, Boston was a dump, as opposed to beautiful Nova Scotia with all the trees everywhere and you know the ocean. And secondly, people talk funny. Nobody knew what a Tinder was. <laughs> if you're in Canada, you go to the donut shop which is called Tim Hortons, and you buy Timbits, which I guess you guys call donut holes. I don't know why you call them donut holes. They're Timbits. <laughs> I shock at Americans. One of our very nations did not know what a Timbit was. <laughs> but you see, by calling myself a Canadian, I felt a little out of place here. When I said I wrote my SATs, Americans would look at me funny and say, What? You wrote your SATs? You didn't take your SATs? <laughs> uh, I had a friend actually who identified himself differently. You know, uh, I know my team would get everything a number, our buildings have numbers, or courses have numbers. And one of my friends was uh, uh, computer science, which is course six. And every time he'd introduce himself, he'd be like, Jack Fu, course six. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the word. The words that you find to describe yourself says a lot about you. And so Peter's going to write to Christians, and life isn't easy for Christians, right? From the outside, you're being harassed, you're being persecuted, people are beating them up, the government is, well, in some places, beating them up. But also they're having problems from the inside, right? Everybody is a sinner, and a lot of times sinners just don't get along. And people might just be asking, right, where's the difference in being a Christian? Is it really worthwhile to have been baptized in the house of God? And so here's my first point, is that Peter is going to write a letter to cheer us up. This is a cheer letter. Now, we're not going to get into the whole letter. We're just dealing with the first two verses. We're just dealing with the introduction. Now, I want to show you how the introduction is packed full of information, which really points to how Peter is going to cheer us up in the rest of the message, in the rest of the letter. Uh, there's nothing particularly special about the format. I mean, this is how everybody wrote letters. Everybody, you know, Acts 23, uh, 26, um, a couple of Roman guys are writing to each other. It's like Claudius Lysias, the most noble Felix greetings. It's basically, um, I is me, T 
to u, yo. Right? That's basically the format. The Peter uses this format. But he packs a lot into this. First of all, OK, you want to be cheered up for being in a bad situation. What kind of person do you want to cheer you up? You want Pollyanna who's like, everything's OK, right? No, nothing's ever wrong with me. Everything's happy. I mean, you know, that, that just kind of makes me want to pull out my sword. And, OK, I'm not going to go there. But we like someone who can identify with us, don't we? And this is Peter, right? Peter, originally a guy named by the name of Simon, the son of Jonah. Uh, Peter, he's, his name is a rock. He got his name from Jesus, and then Jesus even said to him at one point, Matthew 16, 18, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And so here we have Peter, right? Uh, you know, rocky. And if we know anything about Peter, we don't think of him really maybe as solid rock, right? If we were to pick a name for him, we might pick a name like Brash. We might pick a name like Foot in the Mouth. But here we have Peter, average guy, made a lot of mistakes, had a lot of issues. And he's like, look, my name's Peter, a rock, right? Here's the comfort, is that it's not about me. It's about Jesus, right? Jesus made this clear in Matthew 16, 17, because Peter confessed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but my Father in heaven. And so it's not Peter, really. But Peter saying, look at me, because look at what God has done for me. I was, you know, the stupidest of stupidest. And if you read the gospel, you don't know that I was the stupidest of stupidest. But God has called me to be a rock. And you know, it's not Peter alone. It's all the disciples who read the gospels, and you're like, wow, what a bunch of dorks. And all the gospels, all, all the disciples together, Ephesians 2.20 says that the church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. See, Peter being Peter, the apostles being a foundation, they're aligned to a cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. And that says who they are. That's what Peter is saying, right? Basically, that we are founded on this message that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But what does that mean, who we are? Who are we? And now Peter uses a couple of words. Basically, okay, it's not just one word. He uses two words to describe us. You know, if he was just going to boil us down to two words, what are they? He left exiles. Okay, if you were writing a cheer of a bunch of Christians, who are being harassed outside the church, who are being annoyed by annoying people inside the church, hypocritical people inside the church, trolls inside the church who calls incessantly on your blog. How would you remind me of your ideas? Uh, maybe you might write something like, uh, you know, Darren, to the elect, who can live their best life now and become a better you for the power of me and through 12 steps that I outline in my new book, which is now selling on Amazon. Okay, you know, maybe we're a little bit more spiritual than that. We might say, to those chosen to be conquerors in Christ, victors in this dark and evil age. Okay? That's not untrue. But you know, when it comes time to paying your bills, to dealing with annoying co-workers, to dealing with pointy haired bosses, to, you know, taking the kids to the soccer game, to, you know, I guess kids having your parents constantly telling you to do your homework, Where's the victory? I mean, you know, can, can you give me something a little more real here? And so Peter's going to get real. He's going to get gritty. And I guess Hollywood likes gritty. You know, like, like New James Bond. You know, he chooses a word that is actually not associated with blessing. But the word exile, the word dispersion, are actually words associated with curse. Deuteronomy 28, 63-64 says, Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase your number, so it will please Him to ruin and destroy you. You will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess, then the Lord will scatter you among all nations, 
from one end of the earth to the other, right? This is talking about the curse of God, scattering his people, sending them into exile. That's not a blessing. Peter, what is she doing? Saying that we're exiles. But there's a reason that, of course, here, right? Because that's not the only one. Their Lord is elect. Elect means chosen. And chosen is a good thing. It's kind of like, you know, when I was in school, uh, you guys, you guys all had gym class? And in gym class, did you guys have, you know, like when you're playing teams, there are a couple of team captains, and they'll start, like, picking your teams, right? I was never picked. I mean, I was always one of the last people. It's like, oh, okay, you can take him, right? <laughs> so, in a sense, I was never chosen. I was just a leftover. <laughs> so I know that being chosen is a good thing. And so, you know, here's the thing, though, is that us being chosen by God, it's not because we're better players, not like your house. God is operating in your house. When God chooses us, you know, we deserve to be last. We deserve to be the leftovers. But God is choosing us. And that's great. Because it's not anything in us. It's not because I'm holier than thou. It's not because I'm cooler than thou. It's not because I'm smarter than thou. It's not because, doggone it, more people like me than thou. We're sinners. We're self-destructive. Destined for self-destruction. God needed to take initiative. So it's not about me making a waffling decision for Jesus. It's God making an unchangeable decision for me. So here we got two metaphors. Elect, exile. Chosen and loved by God, chosen to live in a messed up foreign land, a wilderness, someplace which is not really our home, dominated by foreign gods. This is vitally important for us to understand our identity here. We live in a culture which might seem to be increasingly more hostile to Christianity. Actually, this is important even if we live in a culture which is super friendly to Christianity. And we feel like we own the place. Because Peter later writes in this very letter in 4.12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Now just think about that verse for a moment. Don't be surprised. You see, Paul couldn't write that verse if we were only elect victors. Or maybe in today's terminology, we'd rather call ourselves like transformers, right? More than meets the eye. <laughs> but for elect exiles, suffering is not a strange thing. Because exiles are expected to suffer. Exile is, suffering is not an alarming thing. Because it's going to be the normal experience of exiles. We don't own the place. America is not the promised land. If we own the place, suffering should be a surprise. But we shouldn't be surprised. You see, to be exiled means we, we have another home. As he sang, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. A better home. Paul's trying to get us off of the things that we cling on to this world. Get us to think of something better. Something that will last. It weans us off from our, our delusions to think that we can make this world perfect, that we have the power to fix a sin-sick world. Because, you know, if we think that, we can get carried away. We can get carried away into thinking that really is our task to fix a sin-sick world. Liberal churches once described their missions programs as civilizing the barbarians. I kid you not. This is what, you know, the progressive churches used to talk about, and they don't talk about this way anymore because it's not totally, totally correct anymore, but, you know, back, back in the day, they were like, oh, nobody can believe things like virgin births or miracles or resurrection from the dead in the day when we got the electric light bulb, when we got steam engines, when we got the wireless. I'm not talking about, like, you know, cell phone wireless. We're talking about, like, telegraph. <laughs> Cutting edge stuff at the time, right? Nobody can believe that stuff. So what's Christianity about? We're out to civilize barbarians. You know, go out there and make them good Westerners. But, you know, now, we might contribute as Christians, making improvements here and there, making changes here and there, and I think part of our faith encourages us to do that. 
The direct effect of transformation, of being cultural warriors, of being world changers. Isn't that just a kinder, gentler way of saying we're just civilizing barbarians again? You know, those darn, I don't know, pick your, pick your cultural war. You know, we want to make them behave like Christians, even if they're not Christians. Is that the point? No wonder non-Christians are afraid of us. Because they think we're trying to own the place. But we're exiles. You know, when we look at the world, we, we've heard in a prayer about uh, you know, the oil spill, which is still getting worse even. You know, the, the mess that the world is in, the poverty all over the place. And it's easy to, to think of the big things, but how about also the little things? A few years ago, a friend of mine, uh, not actually, he's not a friend of mine, an acquaintance. Um, don't really know him that well. But um, his 11 year old daughter died. She was perfectly healthy. Went to bed, she never woke up again. How do you explain that? How is transforming the world going to help that? A world where an 11 year old girl dies is wrong. A world, in fact, where anyone dies is wrong. And we cannot fix a world that is wrong. We don't want to settle and identify with a world that's wrong. We need a home where everything is right. That is why we are exiles here. Okay, so I probably just depressed you that you know, we're exiles. But you know, let's cheer up a little because who said that we're exiles, right? If they're just Peter saying, hey guys, I got a great idea, let's be exiles. Right, you probably say, you know, show off, dude. Uh, you know, I'm too busy trying to transform the world here. But if God says that we are exiles, you know, God says, let there be light. And when he says, let there be light, you know, there's going to be light. And if God says, in the same way, let my chosen people be exiles, that's us. No matter how much you try to pretend that it's not you. Peter and Ruth are exiled in what God has said. And this connects us in our exile on earth with a reality that's far deeper rooted in heaven. And you know, Peter spells it out in personal terms in verse 2 as the work of the triune God. Right? He says it here in um, you know, the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, the obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. And, and, and Peter roots us in, in the Trinity, which is not really a natural concept too much. You know, we like to simplify the Trinity. We, we tend to think of God as, you know, this block of monolithic predestining divinity or something like that. I don't know. Either or that, or we tend to think of them as, you know, these guys where God did everything in the Old Testament. Jesus was helping himself to the donuts until he was sent. Uh, the Holy Spirit, I don't know what he was. Kind of like the force of Star Wars or something. But you see, here's the thing about the Trinity. The Trinity makes God far more personal than we might have imagined him to be. Because there's three of them in perfect love together. They can be loved before the foundations of the earth, and they can know, certainly, how to be loved to us. But at the same time as being more personal than we could ever imagine, they are far more mind-boggling than we could ever imagine. That we can't grasp this God. And so, you know, what we have here is we have the Father, we have the Spirit, we have the Son. Right? What does Peter say about the Father? The Father is the one who foreknows. Actually, the English word is a little misleading because it's not just a passive, I know everything's going to happen. But the word knowing is about relationship. It's about active relationship. It's about Amos 3 2. You only have I known from all the families of the earth. Does it mean that God only knew a few people out of all the families of the earth? No, he knows who everybody is. But he only has this relationship with these people. Uh, you know, in Matthew, uh, Jesus mentions these guys say, Lord, Lord. And he says, I was on the plane and I never knew you. No way for me to be with doers. Did Jesus say, I don't know who you are? Now Jesus knows who they are. They're the evil doers. He says, away from me. But he doesn't have a relationship with them. And so, you know, the thing is that if all it is is that God just knows what's going to happen, it's not interesting to us. I mean, how could that possibly be interesting to us that God knows everything and doesn't do anything about it? 
Rather, know that he chose to love you. He chose to save you before the foundations of the earth. That's interesting. He's got a plan for you. He's got a good plan for you. That's interesting. Especially interesting to exiles who get beat up in this world. We also have the Spirit. What's he doing? He's, he's the one who sanctifies, right? That's making us holy, setting us apart from the world. You know, in a sense, the Spirit is one actively pushing us as exiles. Uh, you know, we, we normally think of sanctification as becoming a better person. I kind of like thinking it as he's making heaven more and more real to us. Because, right, as exiles, we're here on earth, and I gotta say, earth seems pretty real to me, doesn't it? It seems pretty real, you know. Uh, everything around me seems pretty real. But sanctification, the Spirit is making heaven more and more real to you. And, you know, He's the one who's connecting us, who's making us the exiles, putting away the things that we cling to in this world and looking for something a lot better. Uh, about Jesus, I'm actually going to take issue with the English translation here. Uh, yes, even the ESV. Right, that, that wonderful translation. Uh, because it says something like, um, you know, obedience to Jesus and for his sprinkling of his blood. If you just took the Greek and translated it literally, it just says obedience and sprinkle of blood of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a better translation. Because the question is, whose obedience is this? Is it Jesus' obedience for us? Or is it ours to Jesus? Now, I could write a whole like essay on this topic, and I'm not going to give you that whole essay. I'm just going to say, I think it's Jesus' obedience for us. Uh, just like it's his sprinkled blood for us. I don't like the way that they said, oh, it's our obedience to Jesus and Jesus sprinkled blood for us, because it doesn't seem to be getting at what Peter's getting at. Um, if you compare it to Exodus 24, 7 and 8, this is what happened in the Old uh, Covenant, that he, this is Moses, took the Book of the Covenant, read it to the people, now, the people responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. So then Moses took the blood, sprinkled on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant, so on and so forth. Right. In the old covenant, is the blood of animals and the obedience of the people. The new covenant is Jesus' blood. Right. The old covenant depends on what the people say. We'll do, we'll obey. But the new covenant that we're in depends on the fact that Jesus did everything. Jesus said everything perfectly. You see, the reason why I think that it's Jesus' obedience that Peter's talking about here is because Peter's trying to cheer us up, remember? We're being beat up. And then Peter's like, you're exiled because you're so obedient to Jesus. Okay? Um, right. Am I? Really? No. Peter cheers us up by saying, it's grace. It was, it's what Jesus did. It's Jesus connecting us. And that's the full of Christian identity. One hand, the exiles. The other hand, the triune God rooting us in a home. We're exiles here because we have a home in God. Again, I want to say this, this says something about how we face our pressures. External pressures that we can stand firm on the gospel. Even when the world rages around us. Uh, we don't have to go and take a very good back from Jesus. Because when the gospel is proclaimed, the gates of hell cannot stand against it. You know, it says something to us as a community. You know, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. Uh, have you guys met people who say, oh, I'm spiritual and not religious? Have you met any of these people? Have you met anyone who said, oh, I don't go to church anymore, so full of hypocrites? Have you met these people? Some of you, yeah. I, I meet them all the time. And if we're honest, you know something? A lot of accusations are true, right? If we're honest with ourselves, we can probably find something that we're hypocritical about. But let's be honest and think about it. If I don't want to go to church anymore because I don't want to hang out with hypocrites, then the first question I might ask is, well, who do you want to hang out with? People who aren't hypocrites, where are you going to find them? <laughs> Secondly, if you're saying, I don't want to hang out with hypocrites, isn't that a little hypocritical? You know, it's like I'm better than everybody else. And the third thing is, if you never find a church which doesn't have a single hypocrite in it, my advice to you is please don't join it. Because chances are you're introducing the first hypocrite among them. And suddenly you just ruined the church. 
You see, being exiles says that we're not looking for a perfect place where everybody's perfect, where everybody's happy, where everybody is super to me. I, I hope that some people are super to me. I hope that the church is super to me. The thing is, we're sinners. We're not all going to be super to each other 100% of the time. That's like this next time. You see, we need the church. We need the church because we're exiles. Uh, you know, if you're exiles, you don't want to be alone in this world. You want to have a group together that can co group together towards a better land. To think that we're spiritual but not religious <clears throat> is actually not the way of grace. It's the way of me trying to save myself because I'm saying I don't need anybody else. But we need each other because we depend on grace. And through each other, God. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying us together, pushing us towards a better home. So that gets us to the last one. The now is about grace and peace. You know, we're a scattered dispersion, saved in the midst of a curse by the triune God. And Peter says to us, grace and peace. You know, this phrase is so common in the New Testament. It's easy. It's easy to just gloss over it. But it's not just a mere formality. It's true. Do you believe this? Do you believe that when the world is breaking around you, when your job is stressing you out, when, I don't know, the kids are run, running all over the house and uh, making a mess, when uh, you know, you're getting into fights with your, your spouse or with your parents, do you believe that you have grace? Do you believe that you have peace? It's not because we're in the world better materially, it's not because we're richer, healthier, less prone to accidents or tragedy. But it's because the Son of God himself was not ashamed to take on an identity as an exile himself. Jesus became an exile. In fact, he became the ultimate exile when he hung on the cross and he died. Because there he was an exile even from the Father's presence. And because of that, grace is ours. We're sinners, enemies of God, deserving condemnation. We don't deserve it. The favor and love is given to us through Jesus. Peace is ours. Not because we escape conflict and trouble in the war. But Jesus' resurrection from the dead is that first action that is reversing the curse. And Jesus is now there at the right hand of God proving that where he is right now, there we're going to be also. And that place is going to be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And that's what the Spirit is guaranteeing for us right now. That bit of heaven more and more real each day while we're walking in a foreign land. Is it really worthwhile to have been baptized in the house of the Lord God? Because the old Jewish days for a gold book at Jerusalem, an earthly city. But it was a city whose history is full of conflict. We look to another city, a city whose foundation is Christ. And only when we arrive there, after laying down the labors of this world, our identity as exiles will be over. And we'll be with God. And we'll be home. No longer exiles, but will be at home where everything's right. Let's pray.